Right. Well, thanks for having me today. And I'm happy to demonstrate uh, my experience with CSDMS uh, modeling framework and, and the BMI. Um, a few years ago, we got a small chunk of money to, to do sort of a demonstration product of um, wrapping a USGS model around with the BMI. And, you know, at the time when we started this, the USGS has a lot of different models that are all basically built around some domain, whether it's a watershed domain, as in the example I'm going to show today, or mod flow is a groundwater domain. Um, there's lots of surface water hydraulic models that are available, but none of them had really been integrated and uh, using a common framework. And so part of the the interest in working on this project was to really just experiment with the CSDMS modeling framework and, and the BMI. So what we did is we started with PRMS, which is a precipitation runoff modeling system. It's a watershed scale model. And we decided to break PRMS into four components, a surface component, a soil component, a groundwater and stream flow component. Basically, wrapped around sort of each of these reservoirs, the surface reservoir, soil reservoir, groundwater reservoir, and, and stream flow. Um, with the intention of ultimately using the surface and soil components to uh, integrate with the mod flow BMI in the future. Um, and that's been done. So what I'm gonna demonstrate today are, are, are PM, PRMS components. The other thing we did is we wrapped the BMI around grid bed. So uh, the main model inputs to PRMS other than constituent parameters like soil parameters and things like that, the model is driven by climate, um, weather, and we use grid met, which is a Kona scale um, set of climate forcings uh, minimum and maximum temperature and precipitation. Uh, these are delivered at four kilometer scale daily. So every day, this data set is updated through yesterday. So we also wanted to look at driving uh, model components with data components. So I'll also give an example of that. And hopefully this will follow on nicely from, from Eric's, whoops, Eric's demo. So what I'm gonna show is a, is a coupling of PRMS model. We're gonna look at sort of a small demonstration application uh, we're going to look at a small watershed in the prairie pothole region of North Dakota. Um, PRMS is a little bit different. It, it isn't grid based. It's based on hydrologic response units. So we're going to look at this small footprint here. And that small footprint is composed of 14 hydrologic response units um, around this main pipe stem creek here. And I'm going to be showing some plots uh, as a function of time of the values of each of these HRUs um, in this spatial footprint. So you, you will see uh, this footprint displayed in plots where each HRU has a different value. For example, the temperature in HRU 12 or the precipitation rate in HRU 12. And I'll also show some plots that show basically the, the footprint of Pipe Stem Creek and values of the stream flow on Pipe Stem Creek. Um, that'll become clearer later, but just so when you see the plots, you understand that we're looking at this watershed footprint and that watershed is delineated into 14 hydrologic response units and the Pipe Stem Creek here, I think, has seven different stream segments. And please don't hesitate to ask any questions along the way here. I'll now increase the size of this. Hopefully, everybody can see that well. 
So I'm going to I'm going to run this interactive notebook. Um, the first thing to note here is that we're importing these uh, these uh, modeling components from PyMT models. We're going to look at the surface soil, groundwater, and stream flow PRMS components. Um, I have GridMet here. Actually, that shouldn't be here, but it'll be okay. Um, I'll explain that again later. And because I want to plot our model results on these HRUs, I'm going to load a shape file of those HRUs so we can plot to them. This is something outside of PyMT, just so you know. And then I'm going to initialize our four components. So um, we've got a run directory and then for each component, we have an input file. And um, Risa, I think you were asking about NetCDF. Um, just for example, these input files do have NetCDF files that they're reading. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing is the GridMet data is actually delivered as a NetCDF file. And we're gonna extract that data from the NetCDF file and feed it to the model later. And I'll, I'll show that more detail later. So here we're going to initialize our BMIs using the initialize method. And here I've just got some helper methods that that basically use those uh, shape files and put them into a GeoPandas data frame so that we can use them for plotting. And, and that's all this is doing. And also, where the model is using initially this DayMet data set for its climate data. So I just read that NetCDF file um, into another geodata frame, and we're just plotting Tmax, Tmin, and Precip for a given time period um, on those HRUs. So again, here's that footprint of the watershed, and each of the HRUs has a different value that's uh, delineated by a different color. So I want to run this model and look at the output and to find a period of time where that output might be interesting. I simply just looked at the climate data and looked at precipitation. And we're going to look at model results following each of these two um, periods of, of precipitation so that the output uh, show something interesting. And again, we're just using the uh, PyMT BMI methods um, showing uh, this is, this is uh, now time is a PRMS uh, variable. Um, so it's returning the time of the start of the model, 1980, January 1st. Um, it's also showing the end time. This is in days, so we're gonna, the model's gonna run for a total of 731 days. Now, there's a lot in here. This is, this is basically I set up a bunch of uh, lists of variables for each component that we're gonna use to transfer data from the surface component to the soil component to the groundwater component to the stream flow component. And so I just set up these sort of transfer functions. And really the thing to see here is that I'm using the set and get value functions to transfer information from one model component to another. So for example, in transferring surface values to soil, here I'm using the get and set values for each of those. So it's just gonna loop through those lists and get all the values for each one of those parameters and transfer them to the other model. So this is really in essence, the coupling of each of those four components together. And then what I did is I sort of made a master update. So it's calling the update method on each one of the components 
and doing the transfer of information from one component to another in between the updates. So I won't, you won't see the update method as I'm running the model, you'll just see this update coupled, uh, but you understand that we're using the update method of the BMI in the background there. Does that make sense to people? Yeah, sorry, real quick. So when yeah. you update coupled, is, is it important or sensitive like which of those components you run and update in which order? Or could you theoretically just run them kind of in any order as long as you're consistent between time steps? In, in this case, it is important, the order, because we're, we're sort of transferring information down through the system from the surface to the soil, to the groundwater, and ultimately to the stream flow. So yeah, it, in this case, it does make a difference. Okay, I'm just gonna run it for 455 days to basically get it up to the point where we wanna look at a specific precipitation event. Again, this is running that update coupled. So we're running the update methods in the background there. And now I'm gonna run it for seven days and we'll just plot the results um, and take a look. And I've got some helper functions uh, to do these plots in the background here. And all the code for those is available in that repo. Again, this PRMS is slightly different from your typical model. It's not grid-based. So we don't have the capability of using the, the plotting routines that are available immediately available in PyMT. Um, but it's not a big deal. So again, this is just, we've just moved the model ahead seven days in time. And I'm just plotting Tmax, precip, soil moisture, the amount of moisture available in the soil reservoir, the surface runoff, uh, the subsurface reservoir flow, groundwater reservoir flow, and segment outflow. So again, this is, this is looking at a footprint of the pipe stem creek, and it's colored according to the discharge in each one of the stream segments of this creek. So you can see as precip falls on the surface, you get runoff and that runoff goes to the stream and increases the flow in the stream. It's basically what that's showing. Oops, I didn't mean to run that again, sorry. Now, because I ran that again, I may really mess up my uh, my order here, let's see what happens. Okay, then I'm gonna run it for another period of time. Except this time, instead of using the input files, which contain that DAMET data, which is being used to drive the climate forcing in the model, I'm gonna use this grid met component that I wrote and what this component does is it fetches the net CDF climate data from a thread server. That net CDF climate data is grid based in order to interpolate that onto the polygons of each HRU, we do an area weighted mapping. So this function is gonna go out and in real time here, fetch the net CDF data from the thread server and map that data to the HRUs of this model um, and then feed that data to the values of precipitation T max and T min. So it's kind of a cool way, um, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into going out and fetching model input data and formatting it into files. And, and here we're, we're doing that in real time by using a data component to couple to our model. And 
that's the first time that's failed. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm gonna restart this. And we're gonna go from the beginning. Oops. Yeah, the reason why that failed is because I reran that one cell with the update method. And so I think what happened is our dates got out of step here, the dates I have in here for a specific period of time that were matched to where we were in the model runtime. Um, okay, so again, here I've used this grid met data component and I'm pulling precip Tmax and Tmin out of that data component using the set value to, to, to assign the value to the model at runtime. Um, and again, um, it does a nice job. So now in this next step, what I'm gonna do is just Yeah, I'm just gonna override the input of precipitation and I'm gonna specify a constant value of three, uh, in this case, inches of precipitation over a watershed, over one of the HRUs, which is a lot of precipitation for a day in an HRU and just look at the response. And really one of the things we thought when we first started working with CSDMS and the BMI is at a minimum, um, it's relatively low cost to wrap individual models with a BMI and it would be a great way to um, sort of investigate different potential model couplings. And, and also um, something like this, was never available when I first started modeling. I mean, it was really hard one to run a model one time step at a time, but this is also a great way just to build, to develop intuition about your model. So here we're just kicking our model in the butt at one HRU with a bunch of precipitation and looking at the response. So again, I, I hit this HRU with a giant amount of precipitation and we can look at its response with time, you know, all the way to surface runoff, subsurface flow, groundwater reservoir flow, all of those are contributing to the stream flow. And you can see that in the increase in stream flow um, as a function of time from this one event. And then the amount of soil moisture decays with time as there's no more input of uh, precipitation. Um, and you can see that the groundwater reservoir actually um, starts to get more and more flow as you, as you progress in time. So that's what that looks like. And then we can also view that in a more simple way just by looking at and HRU and looking at each one of those functions, each one of the responses uh, of, of different parameters as a function of time. So soil moisture, so, you know, just decays with time. Surface runoff, you get a bunch in the first time step and then it turns off. The subsurface reservoir decays, groundwater reservoir gets more flow as a function of time. And then here's the stream flow responding to that one event. And then finally, just to shut down the model, 
we'll use the finalize method. So that's, that's what I have to show. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I just say, you know, I, I'm an old gray haired guy. Uh, the other thing to note is this was an existing Fortran model that we wrapped with the BMI. So it was an older model component um, and we wrapped it with the BMI, um, which made it available as a Python component. And that is totally cool. And I really have to say that that working on this project was one of the funnest things I've done in my, my career. And if you guys are model developers or model users, um, especially if you're model developers, I'd really consider using the BMI as a template in which to build your model from the ground up. I think it will help you in the long run um, to a great extent, so.